So guys, this is my first experiment doing a hybrid. So there, uh, so I'm going to be wanting to look at the people on the screen and you guys, and I'll just try and uh, balance it in a way that somehow makes sense. But um, so um, we are in Portland and we are in Santa Cruz, SoCal, right? SoCal and, Sa and Portland simultaneously. And also I see a Kiwi. I see a Kiwi there, right from New Zealand. I anybody else from other places representing? <laughs> Uh, Canada. Canada, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. And Ladan, are you in Canada too? Yes, I'm in Vancouver. Hi, everybody. And we'll just start with um, refuge in Bodhicitta. And if you don't know the prayer, you can just really um, connect with a sense of inner safety that you gather from your own qualities like compassion and kindness. <laughs> Agi chun yang ki pe sonam ki Rola pen chir sangge rupa sho Sangge churam so ki chunam la Jan chu padu dane gap su chi Dagi chun yang ki pe sonam ki Rola pen chir sangge rupa sho And so just take a minute and think this practice is not just for this evening, but may it have a ripple effect, benefiting everyone in my life, benefiting anyone I interact with, and bringing momentum to my own spiritual path. Okay. So the topic of this evening is refuge and bodhicitta, which are two key premises that we work with in Buddhism a lot. You don't have to be Buddhist to connect with these ideas. Um, there's a way of framing it in a way that's completely secular. Um, there's also ways of framing it which are very much related to past and future lives and about the ongoing momentum of your spiritual path from life to life. So, you know, just kind of hear it with an open mind and then think what resonates for you personally as an individual and see what works. So when we talk about refuge in Buddhism, what we're talking about is really an inner state of mind that is a very deeply reinforced personal conversation with yourself that is in a way receptive to the wisdom you hear outside, right? Maybe you've heard the Zen expression, see everyone as your teacher, but how do you see everyone as your teacher if some people are full of it, right? Or how do you see everyone as your teacher if some of them are animals or, you know? And you know that in order to do that, you have to be in the mood to hear wisdom, right? And that if you're in the mood to hear wisdom, then a random gust of wind making you turn your face one way and then look at something, it reminds you of compassion and kindness. The wind has just been your teacher. The question is, did the wind mean to be your teacher? or you, did you decide to make it so? Yeah, and this is kind of the question we keep asking ourselves with, you know, the concept of deities or divine, inf inf divine intervention or the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is how much are they intentionally giving us teachings and how much are they just kind of trying to flood us with positive influence that we choose to take up or not, yeah? that we choose to make as a teaching ourselves or not? And which is the most empowering stance for you as an individual? To think that teachings are being given to you or like inflicted on you, or that you're choosing to see things as a teaching at your own pace, at your own level of receptivity, or some combination. It's something interesting to experiment with because a lot of faith traditions might use a shorthand that sounds passive 
Yeah, like you're just kind of waiting to be taught. You know, I'm waiting for the lesson, I'm waiting for the journey, or I'm waiting for inspiration. And, and how is it actually working? And if you were, I guess, in front of the best teacher that could ever be, would it make any difference if you weren't listening? And if you were listening very, very deeply, what couldn't be your teacher, right? So it becomes this conversation of how do you make the inner guru and the outer guru collaborate? How do you make that meeting of minds that isn't passive, but isn't so solitary and so aggressively independent that you're missing out on the fact that there is support? You know, that kind of meet. Now, technically in Buddhism, when we say taking Buddhist refuge, that's what like makes you a Buddhist, right? Your core is refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Now, you have to be a Buddhist to practice Buddhism. No problem, right? We're not missionaries. We don't prophetize. And we can trust people to decide for themselves. Yeah, we just present it as clearly as we can and go from there. So what I want us to do is just kind of a a personal exercise that's really individual and don't feel pressured to share anything out loud. This is just an inner reflection about what exactly you think refuge is. Okay, so when you think I am having a rough day, people are getting on my nerves, I am feeling at a loss, my skill set is not up to speed to cope with the disasters of the day, what do you turn to as an individual? You know, and to just really think for a second, what do I take refuge in and why and towards and from and all of these kind of questions. So just sit for a second and think, okay, on a really bad day, what do I use to soothe? Yeah, to self-soothe. And it could be something as simple as a meal or a conversation, or it could be something like a quality like compassion or kindness. Um, but I think it's an important thing to just think about not what you should be taking refuge in, but what you actually take refuge in. Just kind of sit for a minute and have that thought. And is what you take refuge in something that is fairly consistent or is it something that changes situation to situation or chapter of your life to chapter of your life? For some of us, we take refuge in solitude. For some of us, we take refuge in company. Sometimes we take refuge in distraction and kind of a circuit breaker from the drama. And some of us feel more safety in diving right in and getting it fixed. And we're not talking in terms of like right or wrong answers. It's more in terms of self-knowing because we can't really move from there until we know what we're doing already and if you were to ask yourself what's the main thing you take refuge from or like are moving away from or feels like it's the source of pain or the source of distraction or the source of distress in your life how do you frame it are you taking refuge, getting away from people who are difficult or from your own kind of mental state or what is it exactly? Just kind of like explore that for a sec. You know, in that kind of reflection, did you have any any moments of, oh, right, I, I always do this, even though I think I should do that? Or um, kind of any insights you feel comfortable sharing about what, what you turn to in the rough times? The Zoomers are smiling, but not sharing. <laughs> the in-person people are half masked, it's hard to know. <laughs> I can share. Yeah, sure. 
think what was so interesting for me is that when I do my spiritual practice, it's in the morning when I'm at my best. Yep. And then when right now, when I'm at my worst in the evening, I want to like check out, watch TV, listen to a podcast. Yep. So that's interesting to think, oh, that's what I'm taking refuge in, even though I have my spiritual practice. Yep. It's not what I turn to. Yeah. I'm having a hard time. Yeah, they were saying that, um, you know, the, the healthier refuges are more, are easier in the daytime. And then as the day progresses, they become more and more worldly. Is that a good summary? So. Yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty darn common. Yeah, for sure. And maybe it's just in terms of stamina. Maybe it's as simple as stamina is how much kind of mental energy do you have by the end of the day to touch into things that are healthier or more long term. Whereas in the morning, you're fresh and you can kind of launch yourself well, but as the day progresses, you kind of lose the will a little bit. Mm. I think that's, that's pretty common. Yeah. You know, in Buddhism, we talk very much about things starting in a way externally and then gradually moving more and more internally in terms of our refuge. So outer things do provide safety, but safety from what? you know, safety from the pain that our own mind gives to ourselves, you know, safety from negative states of mind, like anger and attachment and jealousy and pride, like what are the things that actually ruin our day is our negative reactions. And we usually attribute the pain to the stimuli, you know, that triggered it as opposed to why we were triggered or had receptor sites for the trigger. You know, and it makes perfect sense. We were brought up that way, but it's an interesting thing to explore of, okay, how about I kind of take a step back from the condition that triggered me and look at the things that are actually disturbing my peace. Okay, so if so-and-so is a difficult person and now I'm angry, it's anger that's disturbed me, it's not them. So how do I provide safety from anger? Well, I did something that was interesting yesterday. Um, I was experiencing a, a Dharma-like dream. <laughs> and um, what it was, I was um, upset about, uh, mostly had to do with uh, buying a um, somewhat expensive walker that I needed yeah. very much. Um, then all of a sudden my mind started going on and on and on, absolute confusion, um, absolute, why did you do this? This is going to be absolutely insane. How are you going to pay for all of this? On and on and on. And then I reckoned with it and I said, okay. I hear you, I hear what's going on. Let's go to the next level. And I recognized that that voice inside of me was myself arguing with myself. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, um, and that in all truth, I was safe. I had the money stored away. There was nothing to worry about. Granted, there might be other bills coming up, but I still have that money for the walker. And that's yeah. okay. Um, so I was able to detach my feeling from the thought. Mm. And that helped a lot. It helps a lot when I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think we can, we can all relate to, you know, kind of a, a habit of panic or like a habit of deprivation, a, a feeling that um, this is not going to be enough. If I do this, I can't do that. Or what will I do tomorrow if I do this now? And that kind of like habit of panic, whether it's true or not. And then what happens when you have a negative state of mind is that your kind of clean, clear mountain lake mind becomes like a boiling lake. And then you, you know, nothing is reflected clearly in that. So you're stifled. 
you know, and your kind of problem solving abilities are squashed a bit because you're rumbling too much to access your own wisdom and even your own common sense. So your possibilities narrow to fewer and fewer. So, it, you know, it sounds like you're already able to kind of catch yourself going down that that road and go, no, 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 <laughs> come on back. Right. Yeah. And really, then the refuge is your own self-awareness, isn't it? It is. It yeah. really is. It's it's that, and it's my self awareness, my self compassion. Yeah. As, as well, um, I have to really be careful about that because when my inner critic goes on, it um, I have to remember I need some compassion here. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Does anyone else feel comfortable sharing what has worked and what has not worked, or where you go? Yes. Can I share? Um, sure. Yeah. Where am I? Yeah, I can't see I you, mean, darling. I think you've yeah. turned your video off. There you are. Found you. Yes. Um, I think when at, at morning time or when you just wake up and the. Uh, uh, the day is hard, you know that there will be some challenges or health or something um, important. Um, I think when, when I try to be conscious about that, now that I know that consciousness is helping me, when I put a little bit of light on the part of I, I'm going to, it's helping a lot. Mm. Like if it's happiness, like the happy emotion or sadness or something old is coming back, when I'm consciously look at it or write it down, it's much better. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it's refuge or, yeah, it, it's kind of inner refuge. Yeah, it's a strategy it's that works, you know, and it sounds like kind of putting it external to yourself helps you see it more clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. I like it. Thank you. So, okay, so we're going to look at Buddhist refuge. And I think that a lot of you already kind of know this drill, but I think just to kind of kind of come back to it here, um, what we've got are, from a Buddhist perspective, we take refuge in the three jewels. Okay, put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. Because they're reliable. Put a pin in that. <laughs> okay. Um, towards we're taking refuge towards positive states of mind and that doesn't mean some like cliche fake plastic kind of like i don't know sugary pollyanna kind of rose-colored glasses sort of thing it doesn't mean like i'm going to be positive you know like a self-help manual it means a, like a genuine positive state of mind that's constructive that's empathic that's kind of just deeply connected to the big picture as opposed to the everyday stresses and the everyday kind of waves that come through. And it's away from negative states of mind, which isn't to say you can't see what is negative, you know, which isn't to invite us to do what's called like spiritual bypassing, which is to kind of jump over our feeling to what we think the solution should be without feeling the feelings in between right? Because we know that doesn't work. We know jumping over the feelings or suppressing them or like full indulgence going into catharsis, those strategies are short-lived. They're not ideal. But to say we're retreating from negative states of mind means that we're cultivating a self-awareness that can catch them in their infancy. And you know that when you're like just a little irritable, or just a little kind of ennui, depressed, melancholia, when it's just starting to creep up, if you turn towards it and look at it, it almost like gets embarrassed and runs away. You know, it's like, okay, no, I'm not feeling that. Just by the power of your self-awareness, it starts to kind of diffuse and you almost don't need another antidote besides that. But as soon as it gets ahead of steam, as soon as you are in a mood, you cannot talk yourself out of it, right? And if someone else tries to talk you out of it, you're gonna just wanna punch them. You know, they're like, just relax when you're really stressed, right? Just relax, you're like, you relax, you know, right? It's like, it's not gonna work. So to retreat from negative states of mind means just sharpening up that self-awareness that can catch the tendencies that we already have and kind of know when our stressors are so that we can kind of nip things in the bud 
when they're small enough to do so. And that also has the self-awareness and like sense of humor and like self-kindness enough to know that we will forget and we will get distracted and we will lose the plot again and do the wrong thing again and be in a mood. And you'll know that the last time you were in a mood, it was not really a success to send emails from that place, right? Now is not the time to text, right? Now is not the time for like the important family conversation or like, you know, I'm gonna implement, implement boundaries that I've been sitting on for 20 years and now's the time I'm gonna tell people about them. No, you know yourself well enough to say, let's just let this roll through and revisit, <laughs> you know, save to draft, right? Just like take a moment, you know, so you're not saying I can't feel this way or I shouldn't feel this way or trying to stop yourself feeling this way. You're saying decisions aren't best made from this place and I won't feel this way the whole time of the rest of my life. If I don't feed it, it will die a natural death. You know, so you're just kind of letting it roll through and doing damage control and just kind of like sit on your hands until you, you know, don't touch anything, <laughs> right? And just kind of like in that way. So you've got your pre-strategy, pre-negative state of mind strategy, and then you have the, oops, too late, missed my window. Here's what I do in the middle of the mess strategy. And I think that's a really effective way to proceed. So then you, why? Fear and faith. Now, these are directly from the Lamrim. These are words directly from the Buddhist scriptures. We take refuge because of fear and because of faith. And I put those words just as they are because they will freak you out when you read them and you'll think, oh no, we're like every other religion. Oh God, oh, even Buddhists. Uh, it should make us annoyed to see those words. Is everyone properly annoyed, right? What do you mean fear and faith? Not again. But when Buddhists say fear and faith, they're talking about something really specific. Okay, so what we're talking about is, I don't know, like a, a fear that's healthy. It's a healthy apprehension about what your untamed mind can create, right? It's a healthy fear that says, if I don't rein in my negative habits, I will hurt people. I don't want to hurt people. In the past, I have hurt people. Let's just take a moment and acknowledge that. And often I've hurt people without any intention to do so. Just I was distracted or I was careless or I let something fall through the cracks. You know, we're not plotting the destruction of humanity in a back room somewhere. We're nice people, right? We don't want to hurt each other. But we do when we're distracted and we do when negative states of mind have got a hold of us. And so this type of fear that we're talking about is just fear of letting that habit continue. Yeah. So it's not fear that someone is going to punish us. It's not fear that someone's going to say you're bad. You can't be a Buddha now or something silly. Right. It's saying it's a healthy assessment that some of my habits are not the best. And then it's faith based in experience and logic that the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha offer tools to like save oneself from suffering, which really means that your mind is trainable. Yeah, this faith is really a conviction in your own abilities that if you give it enough space and time and wisdom, you can train yourself out of a lot of your nonsense. And remembering that you've already done so kind of gives you some fortitude in this moment. So, so for example, I was thinking about how when I was a teenager, I was really sarcastic. Yeah, and I even prided myself in being like very sassy and sarcastic and like having one liners and really zinging people who were being, you know, rude or disrespectful or something like I really, I was proud of myself. And then I met the Dharma and I was like, that's kind of mean. <laughs> that's mean. That's actually not ideal. That's not really the way I want to communicate. And, you know, let's, let's grow up, kid. Let's grow up. And, and of course, what the problem is, is that it was a habit, right? It, so it's not like I could just say, stop being sarcastic. You know, still I'm sarcastic, just not quite as bad, you know. <laughs> but it, what it means is that, I have conviction that if I orient my priorities to being a wall, I benefit. When I think, let's do my benefit first, and then if I've got anything left, I'll give it to you guys. 
that doesn't work. And it's counterintuitive because it feels like you got to fix yourself first. But actually, if you think of all sentient beings, that includes you, but it includes you in the right proportion, right? So what happens, like you can picture someone who is really in a depressive spiral that is not grief or trauma related, that's just like in a rut, and the way that maybe they or you or ourselves can kind of spiral downwards with too much self-consciousness, you know, not self-aware, not introspective, but just how can I be happy? How can I be happy? What do I need to do? No one understands me. No one loves me. Nothing's going right. What can I get for me? That that is actually a very miserable suffering state of mind. And then as soon as one is kind of got enough mental space to consider, I must take the dog for a walk, right? And then you take the dog for a walk and then you see other humans and maybe some small child has just fallen down and skinned their knee and you think, oh, poor small child. And you've just, you know, helped another sentient being for two seconds. When you get home, you feel better. And it's not like you were neglecting yourself. It's that you were putting yourself in the correct proportion. And that's actually a tremendous relief. But it's, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah, you think I got to look after myself first, but only thinking of yourself is almost like too much pressure. Yeah, and our mind is so powerful to put all of that powerful mind just on this one little sentient being, we almost implode, you know, we create like a black hole. So if you can kind of expand outward, which is the last thing you want to do when you're depressed, but if you can try, you'll find your own relief comes. And so thinking in those terms, you can start to break habits like sarcasm because you're thinking of the greater good, right? And you start catching yourself and you catch yourself and you make mistakes and you fall off the wagon and whatever it happens. But years go by and you realize I'm not as bad as when I was 14, <laughs> right? And probably none of us are as bad as we were when we were 14, maybe, right? In some areas, right? right in the in the places that matter you know and you know remembering that gives you faith in yourself and that is the faith that we're talking about in buddhism which is based on experience and logic and a deep understanding that you are not a lost cause and you never will be yeah so when we say fear and faith in buddhism that's what we're talking about no one's going to punish you. No one's going to reward you except your own mind. Does that make sense? No? So you will see those words in the Lam Rim, but know the context behind them. Otherwise, you'll be like, ah, grumble, right? Yeah, I don't know. Thoughts, thoughts about that? The reason to go for refuge, fear and faith? I'm yeah. About, I hear a lot the word self-cherishing. Yeah. Is that what that means? Yeah, self-cherishing is, is the troublemaker, but again, it's one of those words that colloquially kind of means something different than it does in Buddhism. You know? You know, self-cherishing in Buddhism means exaggerated self-interest, like just good old-fashioned selfishness. It's not about looking after yourself. It's about looking after yourself at the expense of others or with indifference to others. You know, so you're so much in your own bubble that you don't even notice the chaos in your wake. So in Buddhism, that's what self-cherishing means, and that's why it's negative. Yeah. When I'm a little stressed, I... Um, find the nearest couch bed or floor and stare at the ceiling yeah that's a way yeah yeah <laughs> when it's all gone to heck right you'll just lay down and stare at the ceiling yeah I don't, know if I don't really know how that fits in with what you're saying exactly though well, it, it sounds like, you know, if you're stressed out and then you lay down and look at the ceiling, that one of the things that's doing is giving you a circuit breaker, right? You're not feeding the beast, you know? So whatever the drama is, you're not giving it more fuel. You're not telling it's, it's right or it's wrong or arguing with it. You're not engaging your analytical mind. 
our analytical mind is an amazing thing that we want to use a lot, but not when it's mixed with an affliction, because then the analysis is now empowered by the affliction and our affliction has all sorts of brilliant things to say, right? Like if you're angry about something and then your friend reminds you of something related, doesn't your mind just go, yeah, and that too. And what's more, and your analytical mind just creates like this whole massive drama that was even worse than what you started with. But if you just kind of are like mad about one thing and take a minute, you know, look at the ceiling, go for a walk, circuit breaker, you're not feeding the fire. So I think it's, it's really skillful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I see Vicky's hands raised. Hey, Vicky. Hi, thank you for this. Um, I appreciate that definition of fear. Um, so um, we're not talking about wanting to take refuge for fear of being reborn in one of the hell realms. Well, we are, but <laughs> we're also talking about a bad day. Right. Like what makes you reborn in a hell realm? What is a hell realm? Right. A hell realm is your own mind creating horrible conditions. Right. And whether those manifest physically and literally as described in the text or metaphorically in terms of you create your own hell when you're driven by hatred. Right. When you're full of hatred, everything is ugly to you. Everything is painful and unbearable. You know, so we're taking refuge from our mind creating that for itself. We're not going to be sent to hell, right? No one's going to send us to hell, but we can make our own mind hellish if we don't grab the reins. Do you know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's not like that's not part of the discussion. It's just kind yeah. of like, let's start with today, you know, like, let's not make today hell, you know, and uh, what is a, a hell re rebirth is just a pattern of having had thoughts of hatred and anger and wish to harm that you've allowed to get ahead of steam. And you've allowed to kind of permeate your whole experience so much so that nothing is acceptable and everything is painful you know it's just like it's like the opposite right like you know when like you're in love <laughs> right but like in love in kind of a healthy way and you know you're really feeling connection to sentient beings or like connection to humanity you're feeling in love with the world in some way maybe you've got i don't know a new friend or a new partner or a new sandwich you know for me um but you know like some sort of thing that's like triggered the heart open experience. Maybe it was just seeing your guru. Maybe it was having a beautiful teaching. When you're in that kind of loving atmosphere, you've created heaven for yourself, right? Everything is beautiful. Everything tastes good, you know? And it, it could be that it's the simplest thing on earth that you're eating, but now it's delicious because your mind is pervaded by love. So if your mind is pervaded by hatred, even if you have your favorite food, it tastes like crap right? Or like nothing, you know? So it's, it's really everything is about the mind and Buddhism and training the mind, but there's a lot of access points into those kind of theories, trying to get it something that will resonate for you as an individual. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It was good follow-up. Other thoughts? Fear and faith? <laughs> Like yeah, what you were saying about putting things in the right proportions. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the right proportions, right? And you know, this is the thing that we're always in battle with with um, folks that are doing a lot of self help work. Is the word self compassion comes up a lot, and self compassion is incredibly important, but only if you understand what it is. You know, if you think it's I need to get all of my sensory needs met and all of my stimulation needs met and all of my entertainment needs met. And I need to go to the spa and people need to be nice to me and respect me and that is self care and I will demand that. That is a superficial understanding of self compassion, right? And what real self compassion is seeing yourself in the correct proportion and having a renounced mind that says, I need to stop hurting myself 
Yeah. The kindest thing I can do for myself is to stop hurting myself. Self-compassion is stop hurting yourself. How do you, you allow anger to get a foothold and ruin your relationships and your day and your health, you know, or you allow attachment to get ahead of steam and you just become like cookie monster with everything. And it's like never enough, you know? So the kindest thing you can do is to train the mind and real self-compassion is thinking about what are the conditions that give me enough mental space so I can train my mind. If I'm super, super busy with a million things and I never have time to just be, then my creativity, again, doesn't have any space to explore what habits are problematic. You know, what am I going to be regretting on my deathbed? You know, what am I gonna be pleased with on my deathbed? To kind of really revisit your deepest priorities requires a certain amount of mental space. And so it's kind to just sit with yourself a little bit and ask those deep questions. You know, when I'm, when I'm there on my deathbed, what's gonna be important, right? Probably your spiritual path and your relationships and hopefully some sort of positive legacy in the people that you leave behind. You know, not a legacy of criticism and a legacy of, I don't know, deprivation mentality and this is never enough and that is never enough, but a legacy of kind of like acceptance and love and, you know, really enjoying the diversity of humanity and enjoying, you know, being good stewards of the earth and all of the good, you know, the good stuff, right? And we each have our own version of what those priorities are, but we have to come back to them on purpose for them to have power. Just kind of let your life priorities live in the abstract or live in the amorphous realm deprives them of real intention. You know, so you want a powerful life. You have to think about what's important to you on purpose regularly so it can drive you. Okay, <laughs> so then we've talked about this refuge from negative states of mind and refuge towards beneficial states of mind. And we'll go back over this during the weekend. So don't feel like you need to read it, but let's just kind of touch what is bodhicitta because that's the other thing that we're gonna be sitting with this weekend. Um, bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment or the spirit of enlightenment or the heart of enlightenment, depending on your translator. Janchuki um, Sem in Tibetan. And what it really means is it's your main motivation, right? As a Mahayana practitioner, it's this altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So there's lots of different kinds of bodhicitta, ultimate, conventional, aspiring, engaging, you know, it's another conversation for another day. But the big thing that we're looking at here is what is your drive? Yeah, when you wake up in the morning, what is the point of your life? Yeah, and the first point in your life might be coffee, go to the toilet, but like once you kind of get yourself together, right, what's the point of your life, you know, and if you can think, whatever I do, may I be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings, which again includes you, you're not leaving you out of all sentient beings, but just may I be of benefit to all sentient beings, and may that altruistic aspiration lead to my fullest potential. What is my fullest potential? Perfection, which is a tricky word and is a problematic word for a lot of reasons. But what we're talking about is Buddhahood, becoming completely enlightened. And if your goal is this giant project, many, many wonderful projects get accomplished before, right? Or as a side effect. And it's not about necessarily getting enlightened in this life. It's about having a momentum that loves altruism. You know, it's about a mental momentum that seeks connection with others, that seeks to forgive and understand and be of benefit to others, which again brings so much joy to your own life. So you think, all right, I wanna benefit all sentient beings and I wanna be a Buddha. These two aspirations are the heart of bodhicitta. Benefiting others, becoming a Buddha. So what's the relationship, right? Like, why do I need to be a Buddha? Why can't I just be a nice person? You know, that would be good. A good citizen, right? Like recycle more, like I could start composting, you know, like, can I just be a good person? Like, of course, be a good person. But wanting to be a Buddha means you want your benefit to others to not be an educated guess anymore. You want to step up from an educated guess. 
you know, like if your best friend has just lost their partner, they might want you to be right there, stuck to them like glue, cooking for them, cleaning for them, watching stupid movies, playing their favorite playlists, taking them to meditation retreats, giving them lots of hugs. Or they might want space and they don't want you to touch them and they want you to leave them completely alone and they genuinely need their space. Now, if you've known them for 20 years, you can make an educated guess. They're gonna want company or they're gonna want space. But do you really know? And day by day, do you really know? It's an educated guess, right? And it's worth doing, but we really don't know what's the best thing for people. Like what's gonna bring out the best in them long-term? What's gonna facilitate their spiritual path? What's gonna open their heart? We don't know, we can only guess, but if we were a Buddha, we would know because we would have that level of clairvoyance that would say right now silence or right now talking right now contact right now no contact we would know precisely without mistakes and you know it kind of begs the question then like what are buddhas up to right like why do i need to be a buddha there's already lots of buddhas right why do i need to do this and the answer is that just because someone is enlightened doesn't mean they have a strong enough karmic connection to directly get through every single person's karma, right? But we have a strong karmic connection with lots of people, right? With our friends, with our family, with our pets. And it might be that they will only hear the Dharma from us, yeah, because of our relationship to them and our closeness to them. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama could say, you will feel better about life if you cultivate patience. And your friend would be like, yeah, that's nice, sweet old man. But they hear it from you because you have a relationship, right? If you, and you see them and you know them, right? And it could be that the Buddhas are working through you to talk to them, or it could be just your karmic connection with them as your wisdom builds, you're able to touch more of their wisdom. Yeah, you're, you can be the one that elevates the conversation or elevates the energy in a room by bringing out the best in people. But that means you have to have done the inner work yourself. So right now, what are the Buddhas up to? They're up to everything, right? They're trying to benefit sentient beings every second of every day in a million ways, mainly through our teachers, because the best way to help sentient beings is to teach them how to help themselves. But they're manifesting in a million different ways, but we don't feel it when we're not open or we're not deeply listening. So again, that comes back to this conversation of what is refuge. It's that collaboration between the inner guru and the outer guru. You have to be listening. You know, the really deep listening that can hear when you're getting support and how that support is getting to you. Because we're all constantly flooded with support. In this exact moment, the Buddhas love us beyond measure. They know us better than we know ourselves. They know our whole spectrum of lives. They know so much about our potential. They know all the things, but we can't always feel held. You know, we don't feel like we're held in a compassionate gaze, that we're nurtured and understood perfectly. We don't feel that all the time. But that's not because it's not there. It's because we're not open to it. So a lot of taking refuge is inviting yourself to open up, yeah? And you take refuge deeply for your own sake, but you're also taking it for the sake of this ongoing work of working to benefit others by becoming enlightened. So refuge and bodhicitta go hand in hand in our tradition. You know, bodhicitta reinforces refuge, refuge reinforces bodhicitta, and these two concepts are really, you know, the purpose of our life in Buddhism. And how you frame them and what they mean to you might change year by year, but that's kind of the essence of the work. So once you have bodhicitta, then, you know, you get a little upgrade, you get a whole new name, right? You become a bodhisattva, right? A bodhisattva is a person with bodhicitta, right? Or a being with uncontrived bodhicitta. And for those of you that are more scholarly Buddhists, um, it means they've achieved the Mahayana path of accumulation or higher. So that first ground um, of the five pathway awarenesses. So the path of accumulation is something that means you've had a fundamental 
cognitive shift, for lack of a better word. It's a realization, which basically means that you've switched from liking an idea and believing an idea for it to being how you always think. Yeah, can you kind of imagine that? It's a little bit like, you know, when we learned to read, we had to practice the alphabet again and again and again. But now we look at a page and words kind of jump out at us. But it took a huge amount of repetition for that to happen. And the same is true of bodhicitta and refuge. It's like, you like the idea, you're on board with the idea, but it's not like you remember it all the time. It's not that it informs every second of every day, but it can, right? It can, and what makes it do that is just repetition. Yeah, repetition combined with a marriage with your own wisdom. So part of the reason we study is to keep coming back to these things that we have understood intellectually, and we have understood experientially in some way, but we have to revisit them so that we can go deeper and deeper until they become how we actually feel moment to moment. So that's why it's sometimes tricky to be a Dharma student and keep coming back to the same content again and again. It's like, I've understood this, let's move on. But understanding is the beginning, not the end, right? As soon as you've understood it, then you can start practicing it. So are there any questions before we do a little sit or any um, insights? What's up? That is on my mind. So repetition and wisdom mm -hmm. and the teacher. Yes. That's just what's coming to my mind is that I did repetition and I maybe had some wisdom. And when I met my teacher, everything. Yeah. So that's just my truth. I don't know yeah. how it is for other people. Yeah. But for me, that was a really crucial part of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. And that, it's an important addition. They were bringing up that um, the repetition and the study and all of those things are important, but the teacher kind of, right, sealed the deal. Yeah. And why? You know, this is the deep question. Why do you need a teacher when you could just read it in a book or you could just, you know, listen to your grandma or whatever? And the thing is, is that to have someone who embodies the things you pursue makes you feel like they're possible, doesn't it? You know, you can read about amazing things, but until you see it enacted in front of you, it's hard to believe that it's possible. And, you know, whether it's a baby teacher that's just like a couple steps ahead of you that reassures you that some progress is possible, or it's a teacher that seems to be fully enlightened themselves, but who can say because we can't take another person's measure. It, either way, it's inspiring and it helps your momentum. And that's why kind of live teachings, even if it's not even with your own teacher, live teachings, the collaborative energy of everybody in the room, it kind of like warms up your own wisdom. So you can start kind of hearing your teacher again, you know, in whatever form they're in. And, you know, I think that, that it's a very important piece, the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, Leslie, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I have to really, um, remind myself that I don't have all the answers that, um, and that I, and that's why I turn to my teachers, um, because otherwise, um, you know, when you get to a, a, a certain point and someone will say, oh, you've learned so much and yada, 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 and all of that. You forget you're a person. Yeah. And granted, I want to get to the, you know, the level of Buddhahood or Bodhisattva, all of that, but I'm not there yet. You know, <laughs> the, 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 right, right here, right now, I'm just regular Leslie. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting place of identity exploration to like feel very confident that you can become a Buddha while at the same time acknowledging that you aren't a Buddha yet. And it's actually far closer to who you really are to think about your Buddha nature than to think about your afflictions, right? If you're identified mm -hmm. with kind of your surface personality stuff, a lot of that is just a chaotic mess that you developed over a few decades in this life. You know, your family of origin issues and your genetics and your conditioning and your, you know, all the things is actually relatively new. But your 
core, for lack of a better word, even though there's no inherently existent self, there is always Buddha nature in this consciousness. This consciousness has always had Buddha nature and always will until it's fully actualized into Buddhahood. And that has been with you way longer than today's personality. It's a better place to put your identity. So but it's not it, done yet, right? You're not quite it, cooked. <laughs> right. it, it's kind of difficult, you know, to, um, to make a balance between the two because, yeah. you know, I really want so to, um, to it, help all, you know, all sentient beings, but I have to also reckon with the fact that I'm learning. Yep. I think that, I think it's a good approach. And if you just remember that you are not your mistakes, you are not your afflictions, you know, that these are learned behaviors and responses that made sense at the time. So you just do your best and you let go. You do your best and you let go. And the years go by and the lifetimes go by and hopefully you just keep on getting better at it. But I think the main thing is clarifying your purpose and coming back to it again and again. Clarifying your purpose and keep coming back to it. This is really the heart of the spiritual path because then it makes it more and more forefront in your life. You're talking about altruistic intention then? In a perfect world, yes, but I don't want to assume everyone's Buddhist. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. In a perfect world, yes, bodhicitta is what you keep coming back to again and again and again. But um, it, can, it can be something more secular. It can be something like, may I enact peace, inner and outer? You know, may I be compassion internally and radiated externally? You know, it doesn't have to be put in a Buddhist framework if that doesn't feel comfortable to you, but an orientation that understands what is the core of your life and what is the heart of your priorities, mm -hmm. you know, and to just keep touching in and touching in. Maybe it's service, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's just love, you know, but clarifying that is really important. And then when you come back to it, it builds power and depth. Yeah, but yeah, ideally bodhicitta from our perspective. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, so we're running out of time to sit for tonight, but um, we'll do some sitting tomorrow. Um, are there any last minute thoughts before we call it a night? <laughs> so we'll just take a minute and uh, dedicate all of the merit of the session. So just think to yourself, all of the thoughts I've been having just now, whether they were confusion or clarity, may it all go towards actualizing my fullest potential so I can be of greatest benefit to all living beings. May the precious Bodhi mind that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not decline, but increase forevermore. Okay. So good night, folks, and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, folks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Karen. you, everyone.